Chapter 3. Bones In early July 1939, a John Gong Ma called a meeting of five local Chantaburi monasteries. The purpose of the gathering was to cultivate unity and harmony among the monks, novices, and lay people to ensure that Buddhism would continue to prosper in the area. Primarily, he wanted to make the practice of the monastic rules consistent, so that monks residing in all five monasteries would be observing the monastic code and practicing proper etiquette to the same standard. After the meeting adjourned, Ajahn Gong Ma delivered an inspiring Dhamma talk to raise the spirits of the monks and novices and stimulate the development of their meditation practice. At the outset of the rains retreat that year, Ajahn Gong Ma established the daily routine to be followed by all monks residing at Sai Ngam Forest Monastery. He mandated that silence should prevail after dusk and throughout the night. No one should disturb the quietude. Monks must strive to maintain a calm body and a quiet mind. At 7.30 p.m. every evening, a bell announced the time for evening chanting. Ajahn Gongma's nightly Dhamma talk followed the chanting, after which the monks remained seated in meditation until 11 p.m. Ajahn Gongma stressed that anyone who fell asleep in the hall before that time had to make up for his lapse of concentration by meditating throughout the night until dawn. At precisely 3 a.m., the first bell of the day woke the monks and novices calling them to rise from their sleeping mats and begin walking meditation. The bell sounded again at 4 a.m., summoning the monks to the main hall to practice seated meditation, and at 5 a.m., the morning chanting began. Upon the conclusion of chanting, the monks stood up in unison and quickly focused their attention on their assigned chore of preparing the main hall for the morning meal. Each monk spread a sitting cloth at his appointed seat on the dais, readied water for drinking and washing, and helped sweep the hall clean of dust. Once all the tasks were completed, the monks knelt at their seats and bowed three times to the Buddha statue, and then did the same to Ajahn Gongma. Only then were they ready to walk to the village to receive alms. After returning to the monastery with food offerings, the monks ate their meal in silence. The bowls from which they ate were then washed, thoroughly dried, and returned to each monk's hut where they were put neatly away for the day. By 9 a.m. the monks were seated, meditating in the solitude of the forest. Both sitting and walking, meditation continued until 3 p.m., at which point the paths around the monastery were swept of leaves and twigs, and the main hall's floor was again dusted and polished in keeping with a long-standing tradition of Thai forest monks. Ajahn Gong Ma trained his students to uphold the high standards expected of forest monastics. In addition to studying the ancient Pali texts, meditation, aimed at both meditative calm and wisdom, was practiced daily. Ajahn Gong Ma stressed that samadhi and wisdom were like the two wheels on a cart. Only when both wheels worked in unison could the cart move forward. The calm and concentration of samadhi enabled wisdom to reach deeply to remove mental defilements. The intuitive insights that uprooted defilements in turn deepened meditative calm. In this manner, the two worked together to lead a practitioner along the path to enlightenment. Besides study and meditation, attendance at the fortnightly recital of the Patimokha rules was mandatory for the whole community, as was attendance at Tsangha meetings and Ajahn Gongma's frequent Dhamma talks. Monastics were obliged to perform pujas and chant devotional verses on all important Buddhist holy days. By the time my third rains retreat began, the monks at Ajahn Li Damadaro's monastery Klong Gung Forest Monastery, and those living at Saingam Forest Monastery were engaged in a brotherly competition to see which group could strive more diligently in meditation. The monks at Klong Gung Forest Monastery emphasized abstinence from food as an aid to practice. 
while the monks at Saingam Forest Monastery preferred to refrain from lying down at night to aid theirs. The Ajans at both monasteries encouraged their students to put forth increased effort in their chosen meditation methods. At that time, I also observed the sitter's practice. I never slept at night. As a result, my heart was peaceful, and its wisdom was quick to understand basic principles clearly. Although I believed my heart had developed a strong foundation to anchor it, I did not recount the results of my meditation to anybody, not even Ajahn Gong Ma. Since almost everyone in Nongbua village remembered me as being stubborn and disobedient, they too were totally unsuspecting. They wouldn't have believed me anyway, even if I had told them. I myself was surprised that I could ordain and stay as a monk for as long as I had. The news that the monks of two nearby monasteries were fasting and depriving themselves of sleep began to spread through the district. Even though the monks were practicing diligently and putting their lives on the line for the sake of the Buddha's teachings, not everyone was sympathetic. Monks from other monasteries who did not meditate started criticizing the practice monks, saying, These practices are attakila matanu yogo. Fasting and sleep deprivation are forms of self-mortification, which the Buddha strictly forbade. Those monks are causing themselves to suffer for no good reason. Their overly zealous austerities are in breach of the monastic rules. They have deviated from the middle way that the Buddha laid down. To draw attention to this perceived breach of the rules, a delegation of local Chantaburi monks took their complaints to Bangkok and addressed them directly to Supreme Patriarch Chun, the administrative head of the Thai Sangha, who then traveled to Saingam Forest Monastery to evaluate the truth of the matter for himself. Was Ajahn Gongma misleading his students? Supreme Patriarch Chun wanted to see with his own eyes how the forest monks practiced and whether their meditation methods were appropriate according to Dhamma and Vinaya, and the Buddha's middle way. I was fortunate enough to act as the Supreme Patriarch's attendant during his visit, setting up his seat in the main hall and looking after his robes and bowl. As a result, I became well acquainted with him. My mother and father also spoke with him quite often. Because Ajahn Gong Ma was very strict in matters involving meditation practice and monastic discipline, his reputation as a good meditation monk spread far and wide. He was highly respected by people in Chantaburi province, who often crowded into the monastery to hear him discourse on the Buddhist principles. His fame soon stirred up resentment among those who were envious of his popularity, some of whom went so far as to try to damage his reputation. However, Ajahn Gong Ma did not perceive their unfriendly actions as a hindrance to his practice. He simply viewed all such problems as opportunities for growth and development in the practice. He taught his students to see their problems in the same light, not as obstacles on the path, nor as setbacks to their progress, but as motivations to find ways to overcome the faults in their own character and go beyond them. The Supreme Patriarch was circumspect in the way he investigated the accusations leveled against Ajahn Gong Ma. From the beginning of his stay, he followed the routines, rules, and etiquette of the monastery as if he were just another one of the resident monks. He insisted on eating only once a day. Even though Ajahn Gong Ma arranged for lay people to offer him his usual midday meal, he expressed a wish to practice exactly like the monks with whom he was living. One complaint lodged with the Supreme Patriarch accused Ajahn Gong Ma of slinging his alms bowl from one shoulder like the monks of other sects. Curious about this practice, the Supreme Patriarch came out of his residence one morning and walked toward the monks when they were about to go on alms round. He wanted to see with his own eyes how the monks carried their alms bowls. Once he saw firsthand the way meditation monks walk for alms, with their bowls slung in front of them from a shoulder strap and held tightly to their side, he thought that method looked quite practical. He ended up saying, Gong Ma, your way of carrying the alms bowl slung from one shoulder resembles carrying it the conventional way. It's okay. It's not wrong. 
For his part, Ajahn Gong Ma was unaware that complaints had been made about his behavior. He was later accused of misrepresenting the Buddha's teachings in his Dhamma talks. Some claimed that his discourses presented a mistaken and false interpretation of the Pali texts. Without prior knowledge of these accusations, he sent out an announcement one day summoning the townsfolk to the monastery to hear the Supreme Patriarch expound on the Dhamma. In response, a large crowd showed up eager to hear the Supreme Patriarch give a Dhamma talk. Never had so many faithful lay supporters gathered in the monastery at the same time. When Ajahn Gong Ma, himself keen to hear the talk, approached the Supreme Patriarch's residence to respectfully invite him to speak, the Supreme Patriarch surprised him by saying that he felt unwell, so Ajahn Gong Ma would have to give the talk on his behalf. Ajahn Gong Ma bowed, returned to the main hall, and began speaking to the gathering. A little over ten minutes into the talk, a young novice stepped outside the hall to relieve himself and spied the Supreme Patriarch seated on the ground beside the hall, listening to Ajahn Gong Ma speak. Amazed, the novice quickly re-entered the hall to inform his teacher, but was unable to catch his attention. On that occasion, Ajahn Gong Ma gave a profound and comprehensive discourse on the Dhamma that covered both academic and practical aspects in detail. The Supreme Patriarch was full of praise the next morning, saying, Gong Ma, you're more articulate than scholar monks with the highest degree in Buddhist theory. Another accusation falsely leveled at Ajahn Gong Ma was that he practiced black magic when he wandered through the countryside, handing out amulets and talismans to local people like a shaman. So, one day, the Supreme Patriarch asked Ajahn Gong Ma to take him on a short Dutanga trek through the forest. He didn't want anyone else to join them, just the two of them were to go. Despite his monastic seniority, the Supreme Patriarch insisted on carrying his own alms bowl and umbrella tent as they hiked along the forest trails. Although Ajahn Gong Ma offered to carry his gear for him, the Supreme Patriarch wouldn't allow it. Carrying his own requisites, he walked behind Ajahn Gong Ma out of the monastery and into the dense surrounding forests. The sight was most impressive, as though a brave monarch was striding onto the battlefield to strive for victory. He asked to be taken to the places where Ajahn Gong Ma had previously traveled. So Ajahn Gong Ma led him out into the forested regions of Chantaburi province, walking from place to place, stopping in locations where he had meditated in the past. Wherever they stopped, many people interested in Dhamma came to pay their respects to the wandering monks, listen to Ajahn Gong Ma give Dhamma talks, and practice meditation under his guidance. The Supreme Patriarch remained quietly in the background. From the beginning he had stipulated that Ajahn Gong Ma should not disclose to others that he was the Supreme Patriarch of Thailand. He wanted him to address him as he would any other monk. One day they camped on the lower slopes of Sabap Mountain. No sooner had they settled in than a severe rainstorm blew in packing high, swirling winds. Their umbrella tents were no match for the strong gusts and heavy downpours. As was common among practicing monks, they had set up their umbrella tents some distance apart. Huddled under his umbrella tent for protection, the Supreme Patriarch was drenched by the deluge, his robes soaked through and through. Seated under his umbrella tent, Ajahn Gong Ma was also drenched by the rainstorm, but his robes remained dry, for he knew how to safeguard them. After the rain stopped, Ajahn Gong Ma wrapped himself in a dry robe and went to check on his partner. Seeing him wrapped in a dry robe, the Supreme Patriarch asked, How come you're not sopping wet? I'm soaked right through. I know a magic formula that protects me, said Ajahn Gong Ma. Can you please tell me the formula? Ajahn Gong Ma just smiled and changed the subject. When they arrived back at Saingam Forest Monastery, one of the novices went to pay his respects to the Supreme Patriarch and sweep out his residence. Remembering a John Gong Ma's protection formula, he questioned the novice. Novice, I want to ask you something. Do you know anything about the rain protection formula? 
What are the words for it? Tell me what you know. I kind of know them, sir. Good. Let me hear them so I can commit them to memory. When it rains, store all robes inside the alms bowl. This is what all practicing Dutanga monks do. Their upper and outer robes are neatly folded and placed inside their bowls, after which they put the bowl lid on good and tight. The Supreme Patriarch burst out laughing. So that's how he did it, Ajahn Gong Ma wouldn't say. I really thought he used a poly protection verse. After that incident, Supreme Patriarch Chun was fond of telling everyone, The Dutanga practices that Ajahn Gong Ma and other practicing monks follow are very beneficial. These are the sort of practices that will help Buddhism flourish. Such were the good leadership qualities exhibited by the Supreme Patriarch, who undertook the investigation in such a way that he could personally experience the situation for himself and judge its merits with fairness. After the close of his inspection, he steadfastly protected Ajahn Gong Ma from criticism and praised him for the noble purpose of his way of practice. By the time my third rains retreat began, I had fully embraced my uncompromising commitment to meditation. That steadfastness was the result of the solemn vow I had taken earlier while bowing to the Buddha statue at Saingam Forest Monastery. I'd made that vow as a pledge to resolutely carry out the mission of taming my unruly mind. I had called on the Buddha to be my witness because I feared the devastating consequences that I'd suffer should I break an oath to the Buddha. My meditation during the rains retreat was dominated by that tough-minded attitude toward practice. Confident I was on the right track, I doubled down on my Budo repetitions by increasing the tempo, each Budo following the last in quick succession to close off any gaps where thoughts might gain a foothold. If repeating Budo, Budo, Budo at a quickened pace wasn't enough to narrow the gaps, I sped up to Budo, 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 then Budo, 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 until finally just Do, 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 in extra quick succession to keep up with the fleeting nature of my mind. If I simply breathed in thinking Budo and breathed out thinking Do, my mind would still find openings where sense impressions could easily squeeze through to incite unwanted thoughts. The secret was to repeat the mantra very fast with focused attention, so fast that the mind quieted down, became still, and entered naturally into a calm, concentrated state of samadhi. Resting serenely there, the mind no longer required the anchor of the meditation word. My mind would withdraw from deep samadhi focused and alert, so I'd quickly stand up and go straight to the walking path to continue meditating without interruption. The meditation path was about thirty paces long, a comfortable distance for long hours of pacing. I reinforced my resolve to walk through the night until daybreak without sleeping as a prelude to taking the first step on the path. Normally non-stop pacing should be exhausting, but instead of feeling heavy and tired as the night wore on, I was more invigorated the longer I walked. My body felt light and airy, as though floating like a feather, while my mind was uplifted by an indescribable joy. Every evening I looked forward to another all-night meditation session. In this respect, I followed an old adage in the circle of practicing forest monks, which instructs practitioners to continue using a meditation method that suits their temperament for as long as it gives them good results. It's counterproductive to continually try different methods when the one they are practicing is just right for them. As I progressed with my preferred meditation method, a familiar pattern began to develop. When the mind became calm and fully aware... Applied thought and discernment arose spontaneously, prompting wisdom to perceive the way forward. Increased concentration led to a rapturous feeling of peace and contentment, which was accompanied by a sense of expansiveness and buoyancy permeating the whole body. When the feelings of rapture subsided, the mind settled into a quiet, blissful happiness. From there, the mind converged into apanasamadhi, or full absorption, a totally tranquil state free from defilements. The rapturous feeling called piti in Pali has a unique revitalizing and recuperative effect. It is experienced in a variety of ways during meditation. 
Initially, it appears as a slight sense of excitement, as though the hairs on the back of the neck are standing up. As the meditation progresses, piti can arise in the body like flashes of lightning flaring brightly inside. Then there's sporadic piti, which comes and goes like waves breaking on the shore, passing first through the body and then vanishing. In some cases, piti can arise with such an intense and powerful burst of energy that it makes the body rise quickly into the air and levitate there. In fact, Ajahn Sao Kanta Silo was known to have levitated effortlessly while experiencing this form of piti. The ultimate form of piti permeates throughout the entire body, like a mountain torrent filling up a deep gorge. It's a sensation of such potency that it has the power to cure both physical and mental ailments. Often referred to as joy and dhamma, it's the kind of piti that I experienced most often. On one specific occasion, late at night when my mind was well composed, the experience of joy and dhamma that pervaded my heart was so intense that tears began to roll down my face. While wandering endlessly through Sangsara, how seldom it is that one has the opportunity to come in contact with the Buddha's teachings or those of his fully liberated Arahant disciples. With the incredible opportunity for liberation afforded by a human birth, I was struck by a poignant sadness as I reflected on the human condition with its insecurity, its impermanence, its proximity to death, and the possibility of rebirth in the lower realms for those people who squander this chance. I, too, had wandered aimlessly through countless births and deaths over eons of time. But once the attachments inside my mind began to loosen their grip, revealing the causes of my suffering, I began to understand the extent to which pain and confusion exist in the hearts of other people as well. Having examined my own heart and seen the pain and delusion there, I realized that everybody is caught in a similar predicament. But because I had caught a glimpse of the way to go beyond suffering and its causes, I had the advantage of viewing that predicament from a higher level of wisdom and understanding. A deep, personal intuition then arose that everyone has the potential to transcend suffering if they could only open their eyes and see the way for themselves. The sadness and dismay I felt at recognizing the root causes of pain and suffering in other people arose simultaneously with the wonderful sense of joy and freedom I felt inside, causing tears of compassion to roll down my cheeks. In truth, the consciousness that pervades living beings is by nature an aimless wanderer, roaming the length and breadth of sung saric existence without purpose or direction, just ceaselessly moving on without the prospect of ever finding a final resting place. When human beings are born, that transient consciousness animates their bodies and minds. But those people don't know where they came from or where they're headed. They know only that they were born and that they will die someday. Beyond that, life's path is a mystery. They were born into this world alone and they will die and pass on alone. They have parents and relatives, brothers and sisters, friends and colleagues, but none of them will be traveling with them when they die. They will move on into the uncertainty of the future all on their own. The worst danger of life in the human realm is that such people may misunderstand the true value of moral principles and consequently deny the efficacy of meritorious action and moral virtue instead placing a higher value on immoral ideas and harmful behavior. During long walking meditation sessions, I contemplated the unstable nature of sangsaric existence and recognized the same instability in my own mind. How in the endless cycle of wandering from one birth to the next, it had never found a place where it could stop to rest for good. But I saw, too, that in this lifetime I'd found a meditation method that calmed the mind and brought its wayward whirling to a halt. I felt like a long-lost and confused person who suddenly discovers a path that can lead him to complete safety and perfect happiness. Inspired by that insight into the nature of living and dying, I continued walking non-stop throughout the night. Even though I continued pacing on the meditation path until dawn, my body felt fully rested and ready to keep going.
as if it had enjoyed a normal night's sleep. All the while my mind was immersed in a profound sense of compassion for the plight of living beings who repeatedly come to birth, grow old, become sick, and die, over and over again without end. Following that intense experience, I decided to seek Ajahn Gongma's advice. I approached my teacher respectfully, bowed three times, and related my experience of the previous night. His reply altered the course of my meditation. He instructed me that my experiences in meditation the previous night were a consequence of an intense form of piti known as joy and dhamma, which, though powerful, would not be able to sustain my practice in the long run. He insisted that I continue the repetition of budo with increased vigor, and that once I did so, the intense experiences of rapture would gradually subside. After that, I should turn my attention to body contemplation, focusing on the body's constituent parts as a means of gaining insight into the attachments that cause pain and suffering. After I followed Ajahn Gong Ma's advice to focus exclusively on Budo, the rapturous joy disappeared as he said it would. I then turned my attention to body contemplation. The more I contemplated the physical body, the more I perceived bodily experience in a way I had never expected or imagined. Thirty-two specific parts of the body are recommended as objects for body contemplation. These include hair on the head, hair on the body, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, kidneys, heart, spleen, lungs, intestines, stomach, feces, pus, blood, and so on. They are intended to be broadly representative of the human body as a whole. I began examining the 32 body parts by visualizing each part individually to determine which piece appeared attractive, which piece aroused lust in the mind. Mentally, I cut off body parts one at a time and placed them together in front of me. I placed the hair in one pile and nails and teeth in another. I removed the skin, the flesh, the sinews, and the bones, and heaped them up as well. Next, the internal organs were laid out before me. Contemplating them in my mind's eye, I wondered which pile warranted feelings of desire. With the skin removed, what was there to admire in the human body? Whether they belong to a man or a woman, human body parts in and of themselves have no attractive qualities. How then is a bag of flesh, blood, and bones able to fool the whole of humanity into lusting for it? Contemplating like this in all postures throughout the days and nights I spent at Saingam Forest Monastery, my mind became concentrated in a special way unique to wisdom practice. When the mind dropped into samadhi by means of wisdom, that samadhi was sharper and more powerful than the samadhi achieved by more conventional means. As my practice gathered momentum during that retreat period, I instinctively switched my meditation word from budo to maranang, a Pali word meaning death. The dismaying sadness of the human condition, caught up as it is in the repetitive cycle of death and rebirth, had become a recurring theme in my meditation. The body that is clung to so dearly in life breaks up and disintegrates after death, leaving a confused mind adrift and blindly grasping for another physical form to anchor it. The ensuing rebirth sets in motion another torturous round of pain and suffering, and so on, ad infinitum. The transition to death meditation was a consequence of those sobering reflections. The more effort I put into repeating maranang as a mantra, the more benefit I gained from the contemplation of death and dying. When my mind accepted the truth that death is a reality shared among all people, a strong empathy arose for humanity's common experience of enduring this kind of suffering. Facing the reality of death also enabled me to appreciate the importance of the opportunities that life gave me, which inspired me to make the best use of that valuable time to strive for freedom from suffering. In this way, death meditation generated in me a strong desire to practice for the attainment of the Buddha's deathless Dhamma. 
When the Buddha embarked on his quest for liberation, one of his most influential experiences was the sight of a fresh corpse, which inspired the realization that he too would surely die. Spurred on by a sense of urgency, he resolved to search for that which doesn't age, doesn't become sick, and doesn't die. The end of all suffering. Nibbana. Because death contemplation was practiced as a path to enlightenment, the Buddha encouraged people to meditate on, deeply investigate, and directly understand the nature of death for themselves. To realize the full benefits of the Buddha's teachings, meditators must train their minds to stay fully focused on every breath, every repetition of a mantra, and every contemplation without wavering. As dedicated practitioners struggle to develop such a wide-ranging mental discipline, they learn to recognize which meditation methods work best for them at any given time and are prepared to apply the most appropriate method whenever concentration begins to falter. Lacking these effective means, meditators may strive tirelessly all night but still fail to experience the peace and calm they are seeking. Repeating a mantra is one such effective method. It can serve as a lifeline when all else fails. Constantly repeating a single word may seem like an inferior practice, but don't be fooled by its apparent simplicity. Its uncomplicated nature actually works to a meditator's advantage. When the mind is confronted by a continuous assault of thoughts and sense impressions, and a sharp, effective method to cut through the cognitive overload is needed. Done quickly and energetically, repeating a mantra can yield incredible results. Like a strong post embedded in the ground that remains unshaken, intensive mantra repetition prevents the mind from being attracted to distractions that enter through the sense doors. With firmness established, mindfulness can fully immerse itself in the mantra, creating an immovable presence of mind that guards against carelessness when dealing with ongoing thoughts and emotions. Because the power of a mind focused on one object is what brings the mind to the peace and calm of samadhi, meditators should remain intent on keeping mindfulness firmly focused on their mantra. Ultimately, the mind becomes so internally focused, so completely absorbed in the mantra, that the act of repeating it becomes unnecessary, causing it to simply drop away on its own. The result is a still, quiet, clear mind, free of thought and delusion, that is indescribably amazing. Regrettably, due to a lack of consistency in maintaining their focus, many meditators experience highs and lows in their practice. To avoid this tendency, every effort must be made to keep one's undivided attention fixed on the repetition of the mantra. Without this single-minded attention, results soon become erratic. Meditation can progress smoothly at times, only to stall suddenly and become unexpectedly difficult. Concentration can falter to the point where all apparent progress vanishes. But when a mantra like Budo is used continuously as an anchor to ground mindfulness in the present moment, the mind is sure to attain a consistent state of meditative calm and concentration. Practicing meditation earnestly to attain the end of all suffering requires total commitment to the project at each stage of the path. Nothing less than full dedication will succeed. To experience the deepest levels of samadhi and achieve the most profound levels of wisdom, meditators cannot afford to be half-hearted and lazy, yielding to the lure of old mental habits. They must put their life, their whole being, on the line. Otherwise, practitioners can meditate their entire lives without breaking through to freedom. I speak here from personal experience. When I first began to meditate on Budo, my foundation was still too shaky to be reliable. Due to the intense effort I exerted in the beginning, my mind succeeded in attaining samadhi on a regular basis. With my mind feeling as stable as a mountain, I pushed myself relentlessly every night to attain samadhi sooner and stay there longer. The results I achieved seemed spectacular, but over time I became complacent and relaxed my intensity, which permitted my meditation to decline. As mental hindrances took advantage of my slackness, what had once been a robust meditation practice slowly deteriorated. 
The more I worried about the decline, the more my meditation suffered. I was at a loss and didn't know where to turn for help. I finally realized that I had let go of my anchor, Budo, which allowed my mind to drift in a sea of thoughts and frustrations. So I started anew. I picked up Budo and drove it like a stake into the ground, refusing to release my grip even for a moment. I was determined not to indulge my old thought patterns. All my concerns about progress or decline were put aside. I would let happen whatever was going to happen. Worrying about progress and decline was a source of agitation that distracted me from the primary mission. Only the unrelenting repetition of Budo could prevent fluctuations in my meditation. It was time for all-out war on worrisome thoughts. If I let myself think, I'd be thinking all day. If I let myself talk, I'd be talking all day. It was time to use Budo like a buzzsaw to cut through all the mental crap. My mind had repeatedly failed to drop into samadhi because its unruly nature kept bossing my thoughts around. Forceful measures were needed to crush that unruliness once and for all. I was prepared to torture the mind if necessary, bring it to its knees and teach it a lesson it would never forget. The time had come to do or die. I predetermined a time limit for my seated meditation sessions, whether it was two or three hours or more, and adamantly refused to uncross my legs to stand up before I had exceeded that limit. Surrendering to weakness was not an option. I would only submit to what the Buddha taught. Be strong and tolerant of pain and hardship, be persistent and diligent in meditation, and be honest and truthful to oneself. This is the attitude of a true Dhamma warrior. It was during this crucial stage that I gained a solid foundation in my practice. After succeeding in that trial by fire, I never again experienced a decline in my meditation. The fluctuations that had long plagued me ceased to be a factor. Instead, my mind achieved increasing levels of calm and concentration, which soon gave me the confidence to place a renewed emphasis on wisdom and insight meditation. No matter how deep or continuous my samadhi experiences had been, on their own they were incapable of bringing about an end to all suffering. But a firm samadhi practice did provide me with an effective springboard from which to launch my investigations into the true nature of the human body. So, from that time on, I re-established body contemplation as the focal point of my meditation practice. Focusing with mindfulness and scrutinizing with wisdom is what the Buddha and his Arahant disciples called insight meditation, and it is the key to accessing body contemplation. So when I felt attracted to a human form because it looked appealing to the eye, I activated mindfulness and wisdom to dissect that pleasant image bit by bit, until the perception changed from pleasing to unpleasant, from attractive to unattractive. While observing the bodily forms and features of people around me, I noticed that I felt sexually attracted to certain body parts more than others. Paying special attention to those alluring forms, whether the shape of a leg, the curve of a chest, or a distinctive facial feature. I made that specific part an object of investigation. Scrutinizing its distinctive characteristics, I questioned why the sight of that part delighted the senses and aroused feelings of attraction. Did it appear especially beautiful? If so, what distinguished its beauty? The body is composed of numerous parts. Why was that part so enticing? Recognizing that this kind of infatuation was a hindrance to my meditation, I focused my attention on that part with a vengeance, mentally dissecting the pleasing aspects and delving into them to discover exactly where the attraction lay. Close inspection showed that I'd been yearning for something which was, at best, unexceptional or, at worst, repugnant. By investigating deeply with wisdom into just one body part until its true nature was clearly understood, I could apply that insight to every other body part, for they were all by nature foul and unappealing. Sexual attraction is based in perceptions of the human body, and those perceptions are generated in the mind of the beholder. It is the mind, defiled by sexual desire, that lusts after sensual perceptions. 
For that reason, mindfulness and wisdom are the tools of choice for rooting out the defiling influence of sexual craving. Mindfulness is the ability to maintain one's focus on the inherent features of sensual perceptions as they occur, while simultaneously recognizing their significance relative to the ongoing investigation. In other words, identifying which features are central to the experience of sexual attraction and which are merely peripheral to it. This twofold ability explains why mindfulness is so tightly bound up with insight and wisdom. It obviously plays an important preparatory role in laying the groundwork for clear comprehension to arise. When wisdom arises, coupled with mindfulness, the intuitive qualities of wisdom are more potent. Lacking the focused support of mindfulness, wisdom tends to be more analytical and less potent. In fact, the more alert mindfulness becomes, the weaker, unwholesome states of mind tend to be, making it harder for those defiled states to dominate thoughts, speech, and actions. The more clearly the mind understands the underlying repugnance of sexually attractive mental images, the less likely it is to be ensnared by them. I probed and examined my mind's attraction to bodily images over and over until I became skilled at recognizing the defilements that caused me to eagerly grasp at and cling to false perceptions of beauty. Using wisdom's acuity to penetrate directly to the source of sexual desire enabled me to counteract those mental images associated with lust's corrupting effects. Deployed in this way, wisdom was able to understand the truth of the body with greater clarity. When perceptions of the body's attractiveness lost their appeal and faded away, what was left to be attached to? What was there to lust after? What part of the body was worth clinging to? The defilement of sexual desire had long deceived me with its perceptions of human beauty. When, finally, seen clearly with wisdom, however, the human body by its very nature repelled desire. To truly grasp the truth of this matter for myself, in a clear and precise way that left no room for doubt, I had to approach the practice with utmost urgency, as though nothing else in the world mattered more than the project I was working on at that moment. Time and place were not relevant factors, nor were ease and comfort relevant concerns. Regardless of how long it took or how difficult the work proved to be, I would persist with body contemplation until doubt and uncertainty were overcome. Nearing a decisive breakthrough in my investigation, I accelerated my effort to discover the truth. Repeatedly contemplating and deepening my understanding unshackled the mind from its false assumptions about the body and weakened the defiling influence of sexual desires. As the defilements lessened, the mind's knowing nature began to shine forth with greater clarity. With increased clarity came sharper wisdom. By that time, my mind was continuously alert and wide awake. The need for sleep and the pangs of hunger no longer intervened. I didn't feel tired or hungry, even when seated in meditation late into the night. Such wakefulness has been referred to as entering the path of the noble ones. The Buddha called it Ekaya no Mago, the one sure path to Nibbana. He also described it as Pachaktang Verita Bo Winyuhi, meaning that it must be individually experienced by the wise for themselves. Not even the Buddha, his Arahant disciples, or our revered teachers can walk the path and experience the journey's liberating results for us we must take up the challenge to practice diligently until we put an end to suffering within our own minds, which is where Nibbana, the end of all suffering, will appear. I cannot stress this point enough. Practitioners must dig deep to fulfill their quest for enlightenment. We already know the strategies that the Buddha taught for accomplishing this goal. We just need to apply them effectively in our own mental training. Due to the uncompromising earnestness with which I undertook the mental training at Saingam Forest Monastery, my meditation continued to increase in strength and intensity. Even so, I regularly reminded myself to avoid feeling complacent and content with my accomplishments, but instead to keep pushing the meditation to higher and higher levels. 
I knew that contemplating the body in all its aspects was the way to relieve my mind of concerns about sliding back into old mental habits. So I redoubled my efforts to break down the barriers that attachment to physical appearance had erected. After thoroughly investigating the body and clearly seeing all its implications for craving and clinging, I not only became disillusioned with the lure of physical attraction, but also disgusted with my tendency to still take the bait. The more I investigated every unpleasant aspect of the human body, the wearier and more dismayed I felt about my deluded attachment to it. It was disheartening that I should identify with and find desirable something so unreliable and repulsive. Later, during my third rains retreat at Saingam Forest Monastery, I sat down one day to meditate under the shade of a large almond tree. By then, my mindfulness and wisdom were fully engaged in continuous, around-the-clock, body contemplation. The pace of the investigation at that point was truly extraordinary. Wisdom moved rapidly through the body, looking in and out from every angle while examining each aspect in meticulous detail. The mind became so engrossed in its investigation that I ceased to feel the physical body I was investigating. When the feeling of my body's presence disappeared from awareness, the mind felt light and buoyant. Mindfulness and wisdom, however, remained unperturbed by the loss of physical sensation. They continued their non-stop efforts by using a mental image of the body as the focal point of their search for the truth. The investigation progressed without any reduction in intensity until my mental acuity became very subtle and refined. Mindfulness and wisdom were able to manipulate the mental image of the body to the extent that I could chop up the body parts appearing in the image into smaller and smaller shreds, effectively mincing the whole body with my mind. My attention was focused solely on the mental image I was investigating. I saw the entire process unfold distinctly because my concentration fixed itself firmly to each consecutive stage of the visualization. At that juncture, the mind felt no inclination to turn its attention elsewhere. It was completely engrossed in the insightful work at hand. Its understanding grew clearer and clearer until only a conceptual image of scattered body parts remained, with wisdom figuratively pounding the flesh to a pulp and the bones to dust. The sense of having a physical body had long since vanished from my awareness. What remained was a spellbinding perception of body parts crumbling to bits and slowly disintegrating as their basic constituent elements merged with the earth and disappeared. At the precise moment that perception vanished into the earth, the mind and its mental faculties simultaneously converged into a wondrous state of pure and pristine awareness that radiated out in all directions. When the real basis of that perception was understood, the external world of appearances collapsed, and my attachment to it ceased of its own accord. Once my mind had withdrawn completely from all sensual involvement, a feeling of profound serenity enveloped my entire being. With that climactic occurrence, the mind had been purged of mental impurities rooted in sexual desire. When the mind suddenly disengaged from bodily perceptions and the world of external appearances disappeared, it felt like the earth and the sky had just collapsed, like the entire universe had imploded. With the cessation of all images created by the mind came the cessation of attachment to form. Only brilliantly pure awareness remained. My mind experienced that utterly amazing dhamma, for many hours before it withdrew to normal consciousness. Coming out of meditation that night, my heart exclaimed, I've found the precious treasure I was looking for. I will remember that night for the rest of my life. The impact of that realization brought tears of wonder to my eyes. The Dhamma of the Lord Buddha is amazing beyond all belief. It possesses a marvelous flavor that far surpasses every other taste. Whoever has earned the merit to savor its exceptional taste will certainly treasure it forever. It's infinitely more valuable than all the material wealth in the world. 
reflecting thus on the ultimate worth of my monastic life, I felt that I discovered a priceless treasure. What is the meaning of the priceless treasure that I discovered in my meditation that night? Pay careful attention as I explain. What we experience as mind has two distinctly different aspects, which we might call the knowing mind and the thinking mind. In our ordinary experience, these two are lumped together as the mind. But as we progress deeper and deeper in both samadhi and wisdom meditation, their distinction becomes more obvious. It is important to understand the relationship between these two aspects of mind. Otherwise, we will be unaware of the crucial difference between the thinking mind, which constantly deliberates and inclines toward the influence of defilements, and the knowing mind, which does not form any ideas at all but simply knows and remains neutral. The thinking mind is fabricated. The knowing mind is genuine. The thinking mind is intellect, defiled and complicated, whereas the knowing mind is awareness itself, pure and simple. Try to see this difference for yourself when you practice samadhi meditation. Notice how the mind that attains a still calm state of samadhi and then withdraws differs from the mind that thinks incessantly about worldly attachments and never remains still. The thinking mind and the knowing mind are actually two facets of the same mental sphere. Only mindfulness and wisdom can effectively bridge the gap between these two aspects of mind. When the mind is focused in samadhi and firmly grounded in mindfulness and wisdom, its thinking capacity becomes a useful tool which can rationally contemplate the relationship between external activity taking place in the six objective sense spheres and the subjective awareness of the sights, sounds, smells, tastes, touches, and ideas that arise as a result, and which are known internally. The space where the reasoning mind and the knowing mind overlap is wisdom's field of action. The Buddha and the Arahants designated wisdom as a factor on the path to the realization of Nibbana, not the final outcome. The ultimate outcome, the attainment of Nibbana, they called Vimuti or total release, the pure mind freed from all delusion. Release occurs when the mind, in all its aspects, has been investigated and clearly understood, and its true nature has been realized. With its task completed, wisdom, the investigative tool, is naturally set aside leaving the knowing mind secluded from defiling influences and sensual interference. When path factors like diligence, mindfulness, samadhi, and wisdom become fully integrated, they converge on the calm solitude of pure awareness, detached from everything. At that point, the meditator understands intuitively that craving and clinging to objects of the senses are the greatest dangers to peace of mind. This knowledge and understanding arises inside the mind that is dispassionate about the world and supremely contented within. Experience is then aka liko, time no longer exists. Concepts of space have no meaning. The mind and the Dhamma have become one as the meditator stands squarely in the middle of the noble path to Nibbana. The nature of the mind is inconceivably mysterious. The gulf between the state of my mind before it converged so spectacularly, and what appeared after I emerged from that experience, was like the difference between night and day, as though those experiences represented two completely different people. I say this in the context of Dhamma. It's not an exaggeration. After the mind withdrew from deep absorption that night, it appeared conspicuously bold and fearless. By fearless... I mean the mind held no fear of facing the truth in any situation. Wherever my further investigations into the truth of Dhamma were to lead me, I now had the courage to face the realities of living and dying head-on, without flinching. Following that life-changing experience, all desire for wealth or worldly treasures vanished. Even if a heap of gold, silver, and precious gemstones were piled before me as high as a mountain, I would view it as a worthless pile of shit compared to the radiant Dhamma in my heart. So brightly did the Dhamma of the Lord Buddha illuminate my heart that night that I no longer felt attraction to sensual objects.